What's up, guys? This is Heiss. Coming back at you from Heiss Studio again. Uh, still a smidge under the weather. Maybe I'll eventually get over it. It's fine. <laughs> but I wanted to do another behind the music. Felt like playing a little guitar. So I've got uh, acoustic this time. I don't. Have we done acoustic on the channel yet? I don't think I've actually... Well, we had the 12-string, but we haven't done the acoustic 6. Um, this is my Taylor whatever it's called. I always have to look. A 110 CE. Um, I got my first bonus at BNSF, and I went to Guitar Center, and I played every single acoustic guitar they had with well, with a, a cutaway right here, Dreadnought full-size acoustic with the cutaway, and uh, <clears throat> decided I was going to buy the one I liked the best, no matter how much it cost. And thankfully, this was only like 700 bucks, which for a nice acoustic instrument is actually really cheap. But uh, it's my go-to acoustic guitar. Um, and I wanted to kind of walk you guys through the tune Bitterroot Mine today. It's often requested and uh, one of the more played songs from the soundtrack, which uh, is interesting to me because it, it was like, I don't know, nothing stood out about it to me, I guess. There was a technique that I used uh, in composing it that was different and a little music theory brain hat coming on, but not that much. And I, I don't know. I didn't think there was much to it. I liked the song, but it's neat to see other people enjoying it. <clears throat> but anyway, um, this tune kind of came from the primary melody that is in the, the beginning of it. I came up with the... And I had that. I've had that in my back pocket for like years. And the whole time I'm like, I play in a hard rock band. I write rock music. I'm probably never going to use this riff, but it's kind of cool. And I pick up an acoustic and play that riff. And, and that was that. And then it was like, oh, well, now we're doing this uh, acoustic kind of bluesy that railroad game soundtrack. Okay, well, maybe there's a, a way to use that riff. And so I sat thinking around it. And uh, I'd been recently playing through banjo Tui on the N64 with my sister playing through it, and we still need to play more of that. Anyway, she doesn't watch my YouTube because as she always says, she had 18 years of listening to me talk about trains as growing up and that was enough. And that's, that's, yeah, that's fair. Anyways. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, um, on one of the levels, Glitter Gulch Mine, there's uh, a fun theme and I love Grant Kirkhope as a, a composer who did all the soundtracks for a lot of the rare stuff, but particularly Banjo-Kazooie, Banjo-Tooie, uh, that sort of stuff. And Glitter Gulch Mine does a fun kind of thing where it's got a couple different sections to it, but it's got like a major section and a minor section. And so uh, for the uninitiated, major and minor is like two different ways you can feel. Uh, they're technically a mode uh, and key, right? So you could be in the core of, uh, or the key of D major, which sounds very happy. And as Nigel Tufnell would tell you, you could be in the key of D minor, which is the saddest of all keys. Okay, so what's the difference between those two things? One one note, uh, basically not to get into too crazy of music theory land, but they're built on scales and they're actually built on the same one, which is fun. Uh, but when you're in a major scale, you start counting up and you go for your first three notes and you're in a minor scale, you go. So you've changed the third note. So instead of going one, two, happy three, you go one, two, sad three. And that's not the only change really, but that's the, the, the primary thing. So that special third note ends up becoming sad instead of happy, uh, more or less, which is your very, very basic rundown on major and minor. If you really want to get into crazy music theory things, you, there's plenty of channels out there that do a great job with it. But that's the, that's the vague idea. And what... Uh, Grant Kirkhope did was stay in the same scale but change the feel and so I kind of wanted to try and see if I could do that so I have this very major sounding feel happy feel in the beginning the right and that's actually literally the one two three or one two three four five six seven eight it's just 
It's almost walking up and down the scale. That's how basic it is. But you add rhythm and things, and then all of a sudden you realize you're not playing scales, you're playing music, which is why scales are important. Anyways. Um, and so to keep the scale, there's a fun fact where every major has a relative minor. And this is true of many different modes, not just major and minor, but again, that's getting into nerd territory. Um, so when you're in D major, all of your chords and notes and everything are the same as B minor, which is down three frets on the guitar. Uh, and as well, uh, it's actually up. If you go in terms of notes, you go D, E, F, or no. Yeah, it's still down. Whatever. Uh, math is hard. Numbers are hard. Those are letters. Those are also hard. Okay. Uh, so D major. You go down your three, th three frets. And that may sound familiar from the song, because there's a point in the song where it just goes... Etc. Um, and so that's the minor section. It's actually entirely the same scale. All of the notes are the same. We're just emphasizing and choosing this to be our, our home, our center, where we get taken back to by what the melody is doing. Because that's really what a key is about, is taking you back to what home feels like. So, you know, when you're working up a, a scale or something... I leave you there, you're mad. I put you there, you're happy. Right? If I do... Oh, that feels good going there. Oh, we're uncertain. Oh, okay, that, that's cool. Still uncertain. Oh, okay, that's all right. Well, now it's different. Now we're, this is home. Wait a minute, that feels good again. So we were messing around with keys of A minor and C major just really quick in there, just by pointing you to where it feels like you should go. Different chords push you in different places and it feels good to arrive there. And when it feels good to arrive there, that's probably your key. Anyway, nerding out about that stuff aside, and I have some water here. Nerding out about that aside, the song, right, so we had that. And then I was like, well, uh, the next, the strong chord in the key of D major is also G major. So we'll just take that same exact shape from that D and move it down to the G. Which is just an octave. And then... And that's like your whole A section. The B section, wanting to go minor, stay in the same key, but change the emphasis from D major to B minor, same notes, same scales, all that stuff. There you go. And that's like the whole song. Um, there's also accompaniment. The second guitar just plays chords. And there are a couple of cool things that the chords do. And it's something I like to do a lot in uh, accompaniment pieces. And when I go play the song at the end of the video, cheers to the suggestions on that, um, I'll play through the chords the first time around and I'll play the melody the second time. But the chords are basically playing your major chords. And then when we go to the minor section, it goes. And so what I'm doing there is kind of a little bit of voice leading. So we we come down. And 
and there's notes higher up in the chord that are forming their own melody by picking these chords because you could do power chords and that would probably work with the melody still but i chose very specifically b minor because it's got this d right here followed by a which has this d flat right here so we've moved one note there and then when you go to the g it gives you the which gives you that same but in the harmony of the chords this time and then when we hit the g rather than doing a g major we do a g my or a g major seven because it's pretty but also because the g major seven has this f sharp instead of this g and the next chord we're going to is f sharp so i've already pointed you to oh okay well it's already going to feel natural this note's already here when we hit this chord because if you just hear a g out of context it could go anywhere it doesn't have to go there it sounds nice because you've been hearing that but you could have a song where you're doing When you add that note in there it's like wait a minute it doesn't want to push to those other chords anymore it wants to go there and then so this is an f sharp dominant seven which just means we counted up the scale until we got to the seventh one and we put that one in there well, that's the octave but And we like that because it sounds cool. Yeah, there, is there any other reason for that? It might just be because it sounds cool. Yeah, it just sounds cool. But it does hit that E that leads into the B again, but that's fine. The B that we play is a B minor seven. So it's the same thing again, counting a minor scale to that A. And part of the reason we do that is we already have the D in the B minor, right? Like we talked about. But we also have the A. Just with this B and this F sharp on top of it. So that when we go to the D, half the chord's already there. Actually, more than half the chord's already there. And so it's really easy to say, this was home, but now this is back to home again. And so specific note choices can help you push to specific chords, and specific chord choices can help inform the feel. Because we started with B minor in that section, which is very strong and feels this is home. It's a sad home, but it's a home. Walk down the whole thing, and when we get back to the B minor again, it's the B minor seven. So it is a little different, it's less strong, and it has more notes in common with D than B minor does, which makes it easier to get back there as your home again by walking up the chord and changing notes. So there you go. A little bit of music theory, uh, nerdy uh, pontification about how I write some stuff. Hopefully that makes some sense. And if it didn't make sense to you, just know that it didn't make sense to me when I wrote it either. I just figured out that you play the same fret chords into chords or fret working down one or another and then the song works pretty well. That's like a common thing. Like Tuesday Sunrise, the... That one. In the chorus of that one, the whole that whole song is like, well, I like the idea of 26 or, or 5 to... 25 or 6 to 4? Is that the is that the name of that Chicago song? Anyway, the... which is basically a chromatic descending, which means you go one fret at a time. I like that, but I don't like it in the base of the chord. I like it in the harmony of the chord because Chicago wrote 26 or five to four, 25 or six to four, that one, 25 or six to four. Um, 
They wrote it and they they like nailed that song and nobody could write a better version of that chromatic descending thing ever again. So it's kind of dumb if you just try to do that. So I like to put it in the harmony of my chords. And so uh, in Tuesday Sunrise, we're, we're getting off topic, but this is fun. It's fine. The, uh, the chorus has the... Which seems like a weird choice of chords if you just put the chords together. You've got this E dominant seven. You've got an A dominant seven. Then you got a C. And then an E minor. And it's like, well, why does that work? Oh, because in the harmony you have... That's the driving thing you're picking up on. You don't pick up on it super hard because it's not in the base of the chords. If I sat there and went... Oh, that's a D so... It wouldn't work, but as the harmony. Do you hear how hard you hear that in the when it comes around? Because that's the thing that's driving the story. Anyway. Uh, little important things in there in songs is uh, one of the, my favorite things and that's why I like bigger chords and and stuff like that uh, and a lot of what Jimmy Page does with Zeppelin tunes because he's working all sorts of crazy levels of that sort of stuff uh, it's also where a lot of my big band stuff comes in but anyway um, you probably want to hear me play this darn song don't you so I guess we'll do that uh, let's see bitter root mine yes here we go <laughs> forgot about that harmony bit at the end but I don't remember the harmony part that was the last minute addition it was probably thirds oh that's probably what that one is That's the root piece, and then the other one's doing.
yeah, there you go. That, that, that's what it does. Um, the last two things we'll say before we finish here on that one is, uh, in the middle of that, I tried a thing and this, this like comes about anytime I write songs, I'll inevitably think of another part or something that I wanted to try after I'm done recording it and mixing and mastering. It's like, damn, I can't go back and re-record that. And so at the end of one of the, uh, That's been in my head as a harmony part that another guitar could do. So one guitar does the. And the other one could do the. Anyway. Uh, and then the other thing is the, the big way to make it sound like I'm playing it. When you play this, if you are a guitar type person, is you can't just pick one string at a time. Like don't just. Um, I pick like I am laying railroad track, like it is violently p way too powerful. Um, <laughs> my mom is probably going to watch this. Hi mom. Uh, she buys me guitar strings, uh, every Christmas and birthday pretty much because I destroy guitar strings. It's gotten a lot better since I haven't been playing with Hellbot every week, but it was like every week I'd be breaking three or four strings. Um, I play light guide strings and I play hard. Uh, so part of the timbre of the sound of the actual melody is not being picked like. It's being picked like. Where I'm getting like the whole guitar every time and I'm just muting it with my left hand. Left hand mutes is how you play a lot of my stuff because I dig in like ridiculously. That'll be all for that one. Hope you guys enjoyed.